Hey guys, in this week's Casually Criterion episode, we are reviewing David Cronenberg's Crash. But before that, we are talking Barry, Season 3, Lightyear, and Obi-Wan Kenobi series wrap-up. So, join us! Welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. Normally you'd be hearing Chris's voice right now, but he's not going to be with us for a little while. For the foreseeable future, it'll be me and a man who has recently watched David Cronenberg's Crash, uh, because I couldn't think of a better, more clever intro. (laughs) Mike, how are you? (laughs) Uh, Well, it's accurate, if unexciting. I'm well, (laughs) sir. I'm well. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good. You know, I'm disappointed in myself for not thinking of a better intro, but like, it's weird to think of something based off of this movie crash this like particular that's movie, not yeah. wouldn't just be like rude or embarrassing or something sure yeah well it's hard to fill chris's shoes when it comes to that he's he's the master at awkward uncomfortable intros and segues yeah i mean i could have done an awkward uncomfortable one for, that's true especially if i based it off of crash <laughs> all right if this is your first time listening this is a casually criterion episode of the show which is a criterion collection focused episode that we like to do Uh, every other week or every other episode where we review a film from the Criterion Collection that is voted on by the listeners. But before we get into the main review, we'll be doing the usual News on the March where we talk about recent films and TV that we have been watching. Uh, So if you haven't seen the movie, you could still listen for a little bit. It's all time-stamped in the show. Feel free to skip around. Then uh, after that, we move into our feature review, Casually Criterion review for Crash Spine number 1059. That's right. And as Mike said, we put the Criterion show up up on a poll for our Twitter for listeners and whoever to vote and choose the Criterion films that we review. So if you want to follow us on Twitter, we are at Casual Cinecast. We're also on Facebook and Instagram at Casual Cinecast as well. But Twitter is really the best place to follow us because that's where we put our poll and are are most active. If you want to send us any questions about the movies reviewing, messages, whatever, send messages to any of those social media accounts or email us at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And then, of course, if you haven't done so already, you like the show, you want to help other people find it, tell other people it's a good show, go into iTunes, go into whatever platform you listen to podcasts on, and give us a big old five-star review. Yeah, or 10, or whatever is the highest. Yeah, exactly. Please and thank you. And I think with that, we should go ahead and get into News on the March, because we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, a whole lot. Let's go. No messing around. News on the March! All right, Mike, you're up first. You have something that I think only you have seen to this point. Yep. So I'm the only one off. in the whole world that has seen this. Yeah, yeah. Nobody saw this movie. So tell uh, the world about it. I will. Um, okay, so this is a little movie from a little studio called Pixar. Uh, and this is Lightyear. How do you spell that? Uh, what? <laughs> How do you spell that, Pixar? I've never heard of it. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. If you haven't heard of it, don't bother. Yeah. Um, no, anyway, but for real, I watched uh, Lightyear. And although we were being jokey, uh, saying that I was the only one that has ever seen this movie, not many people did in comparison to other Pixar, Disney animated movies. This had a pretty under underperforming box office, mm. which is Uh-oh. neither here nor there for the quality of the movie. I'm just saying it's a thing. Yeah. Anyways, this movie is real middle of the road Pixar for me. Mm hmm. It doesn't really feel like what I imagined a, a Buzz Lightyear movie to feel like. It's a, it's a lot more slow and a little somber in places. And I think it has a really strong first act. But then it just kind of gets into just bland territory where like nothing funny happens. And, and there are revelations and twists that, in my opinion, are kind of lame. <laughs> Have you ever seen the 90s version of Lost in Space? The, the one with <laughs> Joey from Friends? Yeah, and William Hurt. And Heather Graham? I did, like, when it came out, but I don't remember a thing about it. Okay, well, for those of you who still are pretty familiar with that plot in, like, the third act of that movie, Lightyear gets real lost in spacey, the 1998 version. Not not Hmm. the version on Netflix that's going on now or the old TV show, which I haven't seen either of those. But anyways, 
ultimately, it just feels kind of lifeless. Uh, they give him some sidekicks, like Taika Waititi and like some other, like a Kiki Palmer from Nope that's coming out soon, the Jordan Peele movie. Mm-hmm. She's in it, and she's pretty charming, and, and Taika Waititi is doing what he can. But ultimately, this just feels sort of kind of all over the place and doesn't really know what it wants to be. So right. uh, it's hard for me to, to really dive into it, but I can say that I think like based on like the first act alone, if you don't want to hear anything about Lightyear, go ahead and skip ahead. But it's very much about him being kind of responsible for his ship full of colonists crash landing or not crash landing, but like being stranded on a planet that is like inhospitable. And so his motivation for the whole movie is to try to and fix that mistake. And in doing that, I think that's kind of interesting because you get like this sort of soulful search for a character who's like trying to live up to what he thinks he should be and, and fixing his own mistakes and, and all that stuff. But I don't know that I wanted that in a Buzz Lightyear movie. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But that said, um, uh, I don't really know what I wanted from a Buzz Lightyear movie because I didn't really <laughs> want one. Yeah, that was my next question, actually. <laughs> what did you want? But... Fair enough, because that's why I haven't been to see it and wasn't really high on my list was just because it seemed kind of uh, cash grab sequel that was like really, really unnecessary. Yeah, it's not even a sequel. OK, so the movie starts out with a little a little title card that says um, in 1995, a little boy named Andy got an action figure from his favorite movie. And this is that movie. And so, oh, okay. I don't know. That seems weird and like kind of convoluted. I, I don't know. Like just make a sci-fi yeah. movie, you know, like make a sci-fi movie with a heart. That's what they wanted to do. I don't think you needed to tie it into the Toy Story IP in this like weird pseudo spinoff, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. A sequel is probably not the right word. Spinoff is probably better, but uh, that's what I meant. <laughs> right. But, but it's like, it's yeah. like, it's weird because it's like a movie based on like, a character that we know, but it's like that character is like a toy <laughs> and like has a different personality. So it's weird. Yeah. And I think what made the Toy Story movies, you know, work uh, as a whole overall, which granted I didn't see four actually, but <laughs> it was like the connection to Andy. You never saw four? And it, no, I never did. Man. Well, considering I want to. Uh, what you just said after that, that before I interrupted you. I'm, I, you need to see four so I can hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. But anyway, continue, Andy. But I guess it's like they're trying to do that, but it's not quite the same. I don't know, like trying to tie it to Andy in some way. Well, also, but, eh. like having seen the movie, this doesn't seem like a movie that a little boy would get super hyped about. Like, I don't know. Like, right. I can't imagine like a little boy in 1995. Like, this is kind of like, I mean, I can, I mean, maybe, who knows? You know, kids like whatever, but like, th- this is like, I would imagine one of the more like the most least satisfying for like young kids. I can't imagine them being as enthralled with this movie as they are the Toy Story movies cuz like like I said it's slow. It's like it's more like Wally or Up than it is Toy Story, mm. you know? Yeah. But just not as good as those I guess cuz yeah, those yeah. are I mean, two those of my are, favorites. Top tier Pixar movies for sure. Yeah. Speaking of Pixar, not not that this is too related, but uh I did finally watch Turning Red and oh, yeah. I thought that was quite good. Yeah, Turning Red is good. If you like that, I would suggest maybe throwing on Miss Marvel, that the Marvel TV series that's on right now. Oh, yeah. It's actually the highest reviewed uh, rated wise Marvel show so far. I haven't seen it all. Yeah. But it's fun. It seems cute. Yeah, I, I think I will, especially now that there's a couple things that we're going to talk about that have wrapped up TV series wise. Yeah, which is so I have of, some time. Yeah, well, speaking of, let's just go ahead and get into those. Okay. First up? Yeah, first up, Barry, season three on HBO or HBO Max for those of you who have left cable behind. Not me, not yet. I'm about to. Uh, do you watch though. Barry on cable or do you watch it on HBO Max? I watch it on HBO Max because my cable, I don't have HBO cable. Ah. I have a more basic package. Let me ask you real quick, sidebar. Mm-hmm. Why do you still do the cable thing, man? That's like a an insane amount of money down the drain every month. I'm well, sure. And for a long time, I was trying to cancel cable and just go like straight up internet and then maybe get like a, yeah. like a YouTube TV. Mm-hmm. But uh, every time I would try to shop around for like internet prices around, uh, around my area, 
it was always like it saved me like ten dollars because everywhere wants to bundle cable and internet sure, and the internet yeah. was just really expensive so like it would have cost more money to end up with a live tv which i want the live tv because i watch a lot of soccer and oh of course yeah i don't even i like duh. having that yeah. um and then also my wife watches a lot of hallmark so <laughs> <laughs> those two things kind of keep, keep us attached to needing like a live tv but this weekend, uh, I was at the T-Mobile store getting my wife a new iPhone, and they offer a pretty cheap internet package that's like 30 ish dollars a month, 30 40 hey, something hey. like that, yeah. um, for internet. So pretty soon, I'm going to switch over and like fully cut the cord, which I'm excited about. Yeah, but how are you watch your soccer? YouTube TV. It actually gives me more sports channels than I have currently in my cable package, and that's like $50. Huzzah! Right? Yeah. So... Uh, it, it'll work out, I think. And it comes with Hallmark, too. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Now, so. about Barry Season 3, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to that. Kick us off, man. What'd you think of Barry Season 3? I think everyone knows who watch, who listens to this show probably knows that you're a fan of Seasons 1 and 2, for sure. Yeah. Well, season 3 is no different, man. I thought it was <laughs> really, really good, especially, especially by the end. I think uh, early on, I was wondering where it was going to go because it kind of changed tones so much and got in my opinion, significantly darker. Yeah, it seems to have left all, not all attempts at comedy, but it seems to have found its niche in the world of comedy, I guess, which is to be very dark and sad. <laughs> yeah, and, and when the comedic moments do happen in this season, I, I thought they actually hit exceptionally hard just because the rest is so dark. <laughs> so They're, that kind of worked. Y- yeah, well, it has a very, like, the violence and the humor has a very Coen Brothers feel to me in this season. Like, mm-hmm. oh, man, I, I'll be super vague because it kind of happens late, later on in this uh, the season. But, for example, like, one character is, like, pinned down and they're, they're fighting. This this guy's, like, on top choking them, you know? And mm-hmm. they grab, a um, like, scissors, I think, or a knife. Yeah. And they, they try to like stab it into the person's head and but it, like it goes through their head and touches like and pokes out their eyeball in the front of their head. <laughs> yeah. And, and at yeah, first yeah. they're like, What'd you do to my eye? And like it's kind of played for like a really darkly funny bit, right? Because like you, he's not even aware yet that he's dead. <laughs> this this person. Yeah. Yeah. That That's was weird, the kind of but humor, funny. right, that this kind of season really plays with, I think. And that kind of reminded me of Cohen Brothers a little bit. Yeah, I think so. And a person who's usually like a huge source of comic relief uh, in Henry Winkler is like the acting coach. What's happening to him in this season is so dark that like there's not much opportunity to milk humor out of it. But there's a couple of times where like despite what's going on, he does something randomly funny that that surprised me and did make me laugh. So they they squeeze it out there, but it's mostly mostly a lot more serious and a lot more um, intentionally shot. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. The tone this season, just the cinematography and like the the filmmaking language was already great, especially in season two. But Bill mm-hmm. Hader took over directing in this one, and he put a lot of his own touches on there, and uh, you could feel it. Yeah, I feel a style more, like a like a language more than any other. Yeah, well, kind of like Better Call Saul or Breaking Bad have like a very specific like filmmaking language about them that feels really unique to them, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think Barry season three has found its its legs when it comes to that. And I think it's going to be even more so in season four because Bill Hader is supposed to direct the whole season four. Yeah. And not just part of it. I think he directed the last few episodes of three, maybe. I think he directed a lot of three, but I don't think it's it wasn't the entirety. Yeah. And, and I will say that I this is responsible for probably like a one of my top three favorite chases of all time or here in season three. <laughs> oh yeah. There's a there's a chase scene which is just I don't know, so cool. Like and well filmed and intentional and it feels exciting yet distant and like mm-hmm. clinical in the way that it approaches it, you know? It's just sort of like very matter of fact and like a lot of wide shots. I don't know. Pretty, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. great like, stuff. In terms of car chases throughout cinema, you know, um, I always think of how French Connection has those shots from, like, the, the camera's probably like mounted on the front of a car. Yeah. Or, <laughs> and it's, like, or driving the back through of the one sh- streets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, like, really close and has those shots to really, like, immerse you and put you in the feel. 
this almost does the exact opposite, <laughs> but still manages to make like a really compelling, interesting uh, car chase. So I think just like that is what makes this car chase stand out and kind of like differentiate itself. And I think maybe up there with things like, like I consider the car chase ending of like death proof yeah, to be that's a great maybe chase. number one in my, in my view. It's good. It's a really good one. I would hate to, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's, it's up there. Like you have like the great escape, the motorcycle stuff. And then you have French yeah. connection. You have bullet, uh, a lot of Steve McQueen in there. Yeah. He drove you cars. Know, but, yeah. But, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is just as thrilling as something like that. And well, like there's, there's a specific shot where that to me, I still think about to this day, there's two specific shots about with that motorcycle chase you're talking about. One of which I don't know, the, the camera's mounted on a vehicle that's like, I don't know, 50 feet behind this motorcycle and it's merging onto the highway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. G- going down like the ramp and just like that whole shot. I don't know what it was. It's so simple yet. So compelling. I don't know. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. I don't remember where I saw this. I think it was on TikTok or something, maybe YouTube. Bill Hader talking about shooting that scene. And he was saying that like, the, one of the scariest things to him is merging onto a highway. Oh, man, I feel that. Yeah. <laughs> so he wanted to really like show that. And I think just that kind of focus, that a- attention to, you know, that's not what the scene is about because he's running from other people. Sure. And you know, being chased. But to then incorporate that sort of extra element to add on top and like really thicken out the scene, if you will. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Great. And, and there's another shot later on in that chase where like a motorcycle like drives up onto the roof of a building somehow. Oh, yeah. And it's just like, what the hell? And like starts. Uh, well, I don't want to give it away, but it's just just watch Barry season three. It's It's so well shot and dark and comfortable with how dark it's getting. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot more else to say because we're not going to get into like too deep into spoilers. But knowing that there's a season four makes the ending of season three so crazy to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like for I real. didn't see it coming, and and I think part of that is because I knew season four is happening, and yeah. that's I, to me I, I love the ending of this because I just I can't even you and I tried to theorize and talk about like what's going to happen next season and yeah, I like we how almost can had no possibly, answers. Yeah, how can the status quo? I don't. You know how can we continue <laughs> unless the show becomes something else? Yeah, uh, and I'm excited to see what they come up with. Yeah, me too. I think I think it's really great, and we didn't mention it much, but I think N- Noho Hank continues to be. Probably like my favorite character, uh, other than Bill Hader. <laughs> yeah, um, his arc this yeah, season was pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, <laughs> again, not, not getting too much into spoilers, but what happens to his character in the like final episode, I think, is one of the coolest things that I've seen like in movies or TV for a while. Like in terms of just <laughs> just really like inventive in the way that it shows a situation play out and makes it probably scarier <laughs> yeah and more intense than um <laughs> than it would be if it had been in the hands of like a, a different director choosing to like show you more if you will mm-hmm. if that makes sense yeah well bill Hader's style is very um intentional and restrained you know a lot of wide shots mm-hmm. I, don't know, I, I dig it yeah it's kind of a less is more uh, it's almost minimalist like I think I, t- I told you this at one point, but like I feel like in the the final episode of the season, I was like, were there were there more than like forty shots in that entire episode? <laughs> I'm not sure, probably, yeah. but yeah, but, but I don't know. He does that thing, which I, I'm always saying, especially when we review Criterion's and you know, like foreign films and stuff. It's like one well composed composition, and just let a scene play out the whole time. You know, cutting is not necessary. Like it's like very drive my car esque. You know, or you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm reminded a lot of like South Korean cinema and stuff like that. Just like one really great wide shot, and just let the actors walk and play the scene throughout it. You know, and you know, shift the camera, tilt it, pan, do what you got to do. But I, I'm always a big fan of whenever you know uh, filmmakers can can make that style compelling. Yeah, I agree. I'm with you. But. Uh... I don't know if you said specifically, but you liked season three. I'm, I'm figuring. Um, how does it compare with the other two for you? Oh, head and shoulders above them. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think season one was okay. Okay to good. Season two was solid good. 
And uh, season three, it just dropped the premise of being a, a, a silly comedy and started doing something more interesting, in my opinion. Yeah. I think it's evolved. And yeah, I'm okay if it evolves back towards a little bit more humor or something like that. But as long as it keeps evolving, I think every season kind of feels a little different from the one before. Uh, and I'm into that. Yeah. But like like we said earlier, it's like I just right now I can't even comprehend what they're going to do in season four. So, yeah, me neither. <laughs> we'll see. And we'll we'll talk about it, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure we will. OK. Anything else you want to say about Barry season three? Nope. I'm good. OK, so. The final event in News on the March before the main event in the feature review. And that is Obi-Wan Kenobi season wrap-up. I believe we talked about the first three episodes, right? Is that right? That sounds right. It's yeah. been a little bit since we put out an episode, so yeah, probably. So I think we'll probably be pretty vague about our thoughts uh, up front and then let you know when we're going to get into spoilers. At that point, if you don't want to hear any spoilers about Obi-Wan, Skip ahead in the show notes. Uh, it's all time stamped. You can get on right into the crash. Yeah. All right, sir. If you want. If you want. If you're here for crash, then we've, <laughs> we've got that covered. Okay, so Obi-Wan Kenobi season or one, <laughs> series one. I don't even know. We're getting a season two of this show yet, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, what do you that think, sir? Man, I thought it was so good. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think I didn't necessarily feel as confident about how good it was until the last episode was over. I think it really wrapped everything up and like sealed the deal as like, this might be my favorite star Wars thing uh, or like live action thing uh, mm -hmm. outside of the original, original trilogy, which used to be, uh, you know, held by Mandalorian. Cause that was just so good. But this, uh, this has such heavy impact on the like main saga that it feels just so much more important and it in some ways it almost makes me feel like realize how like irrelevant mandalorian is in some places because this just seems so cool and has such an impact like i know the next time i watch a new hope it's gonna hit so differently in so many places yeah. and even return of the jedi yeah and that's what i would like these to do mm-hmm and and it does it in a way that's not just like, hey, you remember that thing that happens? Let us explain it so it so you know exactly what they were talking about when you rewatch like the original trilogy. It just adds more underlying layers, more more just like thematic stuff to think about, mm -hmm. which is rather than like detailed explanations. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, there's some of that in there for sure, but uh, I yeah. think you're right. Like it it handles it in a way that's like it doesn't feel as like. Forced is like when Han Solo got his last name in the Solo movie or some, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I loved it. It was kind of magical to see you and McGregor back, which I think we said before, so I don't need to harp on that too much. But what did you think? Yeah, I am right there with you. I don't know if it's my favorite live action thing in the Disney era, but it's it's certainly like up there. It's got some some things that I were like, I was like mm, uh, that I'll get into here in a minute that I think you can kind of see the budget being stretched here. But mm -hmm. overall, the final episode, I think, just really ties this thing all together and makes the series just land um, in, a, in a way where it just feels important. It recontextualizes things from A New Hope, and that's kind of the fun of this, right? Like, I can see a lot of people not liking this if they don't like the prequels, or I can see people not liking this if they're not really up on the lore. Like, if they just, you know, like, watch Star Wars with their family or friends whenever it comes out in a movie theater. Like, I can see this not being, like, stunning because it's not blowing the levels off, like, the VFX, like Star Wars tends to do in every movie, right? Yeah. Like, that's kind of what Star Wars has always been known for, is, like, pushing the limits of technology. This show doesn't do that. So I can understand, if you're not a fan of the lore or the characters, being like, this isn't what I wanted. But... If you're into the story, if you've been following it, if you are familiar with the prequels and don't just hate them and hate Hayden Christensen and and the memes and all that stuff, then I think this is going to be really enjoyable for you. Uh, that it was for me, and it bridges this gap for the first time. Like I always understood that Hayden Christensen and Darth Vader were supposed to be the same person. Like I understood that in theory, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But like, but this really, I can, I can now 
think of them as the same person in a way that I couldn't before. I could only understand they were before, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. This this kind of helps transition from End of Revenge of the Sith to A New Hope. Yeah, yeah. A little and, smoother. Yeah, and, and makes a lot of the dialogue line up a little bit better than it did before, uh, which is, I think, the show's greatest feat, which is giving a, a, an adventure that many thought was unnecessary, and maybe it is unnecessary, but I would argue that like the way it enriches and like helps bridge the gap between the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy is pretty impressive in my opinion like it's it's a prequel that just enhances which is what you want a prequel to do and, and recontextualize and add more meaning to things and they play with that right like so what they had to do is they had to go back and like okay what is carrie fisher what are all her lines mentioning or thinking about obi-wan kenobi all right we have to make sure whatever we do in the show doesn't mess with any of that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, it has to make sense for people who don't watch Obi-Wan Kenobi and only watch the movies. And I think they do that just so impressively in this six episode series. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. It's uh, I like that it recontextualizes and adds meaning as opposed to like spends a lot of time defining things. Yeah. And uh, personally, like I've talked to people who those recontextualizations or... um things like that they feel like that does mess with the original tri trilogy in a bad way or i've talked to some people that did feel that they messed up in terms of like putting stuff in there that doesn't make sense but i i think if you're really well versed it does like i, I don't know if those people go as deep as to like reading any of the the canon novels or watching any of clone wars sure yeah or anything like that so I think I think you're right about no. honestly, like there, I mean, there are a lot of rewards for people who do keep up with those things in this show. But I would, I mean, that's fair. I think a lot of people can can come away thinking, okay, this this messes with the original trilogy a little too much, or something doesn't make sense now, or or whatever. I would say that you're you're you're, you're wrong, but I understand how you could feel that way. I, I yeah. think it's safe to say it doesn't. They, they took a lot of efforts to make sure that everything would still fit. Now, the, the question the viewer, the, each person has to decide for themselves is like, is this how you want to enjoy Star Wars? And I, I think once people start to realize that a lot of these prequels and, and Star Wars series are going to have to be like recontextualizing or adding more lore, it's, you'll get a lot more out of it. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah. I could, I think talk any like if someone came at me with like here this invents this plot hole I'm pretty sure like I myself could be like well here's how it doesn't I'm confident that whatever they threw at me I could I could be like well no not really yeah I think you could too from experience <laughs> I think from asking you questions here and there <laughs> yeah well I, I mean those thoughts I, yeah I'm a huge nerd when it comes to Star Wars so I'm not the slightest bit objective to this but I will say despite all that I do have some complaints about this show it's not perfect yeah do you want to get into this yeah first of all. As much as I enjoy it, I think you need to do maybe like one less episode or add more fluff into the episodes that are there. I think certain episodes are kind of hurt by the lack of like, like, for example, episode four. I guess we're going to get into spoilers from here on out. Yeah. Episode four, I think, could have benefited from like a, a Mission Impossible style scene where they're like talking about breaking in a little bit more <laughs> and like what their yeah. plan is. Uh, uh, is that the that the one where Leia is captured? Yeah, he has to like break into the Inquisitor's Fortress Inquisitorious place. Mm -hmm. Just like more fleshing out of the side characters like Lil Cube. <laughs> What's his name? Yeah. In the show? Oh man, I don't know. Yeah. O'Shea then, Jackson Jr. Maybe is what I'm talking therein about. lies your point. <laughs> oh, yeah. O'Shea Jackson Jr. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Roken is his name. Roken, okay. Th yeah. That probably lies your your point like right in there, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, it's like I don't know his name. Yeah, his character's set up to do some cool stuff, but I don't know. A couple more scenes would have been nice, you know? But I think my main complaint, other than side characters not being fleshed out enough for a TV show, would be you can really start to see the budget strain in this and the limits of the volume. Yeah. Especially, I think, in episode five, whenever the stormtroopers are, are like gathering outside of this base and they're getting ready to blow the doors down, you can definitely see where, like, you know there's like a digital wall like right behind them yeah yeah yeah. i think i don't know I, I i think my focus has been on so much on like this overall series and the mm -hmm. overall story and themes and 
characters and emotions and stuff that like because i've seen those complaints and like i guess they just weren't on my mind i at at some point i stopped looking for those (laughs) sure yeah and so maybe by that point because i don't know if i notice what you're talking about like thinking back on it i can kind of i can imagine what you were saying but i don't know i i think it's just accepting that and maybe it's there's been so many disney series that have been you know, stretched out into multi-episodes and the budget stretch that maybe I'm just getting used to it between this and Marvel. Sure. I don't know. Fair enough. What I guess it's something that like I was able to get past pretty quick, but like I think there's probably like one or two things in every episode where I'm like, hmm. Except for yeah. the last episode. I feel like that one looks pretty good. Yeah, I definitely didn't don't remember anything in the last episode. Do you think it's like do you, do you feel like you can you can almost see like the circle boundary where the actors can't go beyond? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, basically, it's like you can tell that like they're in a a big flat room, like a flat ground, and like they are blocked and positioned and framed in such a way to where like sometimes like I don't maybe you just need more going on in the background. Add add some digital stormtroopers in the background or something. Like add more steam or weather effects going on. I, you know, I don't know, but there's some times in this where you can definitely feel like there's just a bunch of people standing around on us on a stage yeah i, I don't know i i don't know they need more set dressing i yeah, i don't know what yeah but, M- more interaction between background and foreground or more yeah or like more a, things a better that, blend <laughs> yeah more things that cross that space instead of feel like two distinct spaces i i i think i get what you're saying yeah i mean but the thing is it's it's still early in the technology yet you know Mm-hmm. I'm sure it'll get better. For example, I think like some of the best use of the volume that I've seen is uh, there's like I think the one that Bryce Dallas Howard directed in Book of Boba Fett, where like the Mandalorian gets in an elevator and like the background, like the volume starts to shift in the background and it makes it look like the elevator is going up and down and it's all in like this oh, one right. shot, you know? Yeah. Like that is how you need to use the volume. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But. Um... Um, like I said, that's pretty minor. Like I'm not, I, I have a hard time really understanding like the mass criticism this show seems to get, but that's just Star Wars in general, I think. Yeah. I mostly disregard that. (laughs) Yeah. I think people are being a little unfair because it's like, you did know that this was a show and not a movie. You can lament all day and night that it looks like a show, but Hey man, it looks better than 90% of TV. My other complaint, uh, the way the ships take off in this Mm-hmm. The physics don't quite seem right. The way they take hmm. off and land in a lot of places. Yeah. I think John Favreau in The Mandalorian pays better attention to like the physics of Star Wars ships. Like they need to hover a little bit and then kind of take off. You know what I mean? Like like this yeah. just feels like ships just go straight from flying to landing without much. It just feels a little wonky. Like you don't feel the weight of the ship? Yeah, or something. It just feels like... yeah. Like they, I don't know. They're going a little too fast and zippy, a lot of times. Yeah, I can see that. I I do think that the action, like the choreography, and mm-hmm. some of the fight scenes was really good. Yeah, uh, that duel, that final duel was incredible. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was great, and you know, I probably rivals any other duel that I can think of, except for maybe the. The Phantom Menace, like Duel of the Fates. I'm partial to the Revenge of the Sith duel between Obi Wan and Anakin on Mustafar. Yeah, that's an yeah. important one. <laughs> it's an important one, and it's just like I don't know. There's like lava everywhere. It's just epic. It was designed to be epic. There's some good old John Williams score going on. Yeah. But yeah, this is definitely. I mean, one of the best duels of in Star Wars for sure. Yeah, which is fun, and we get to see some really crazy Darth Vader. You know. Yeah. I can understand people who don't like the show, but it's like, come on, man. If you were like a little kid and, and you liked Darth Vader, how can you not feel a little like excitement watching the Darth Vader stuff in the show? Because it's all good. Like there's not one scene where they messed up Vader. Yeah. And I mean, I think even like the least crazy, scary stuff he does on this is probably more scary and intense than some of the stuff he does in the original trilogy that made him, you know, the ominous figure that he is. Right. Yeah. All he did in the original trilogy really was like a couple lightsab- uh, lightsaber fights with Luke, but mainly it was like choking officers in the, yeah. In his ship. Yeah. Just like force choking. And yeah, he goes well beyond that and does some really cool, really scary stuff. You know, it's kind of like the first time 
uh, you watch Rogue One, right? And you see those that there's the one scene with him where he like yeah kicks some ass for a little bit, and you're like, wow. But they 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 up that even more. In this. Yeah, I would say the body count in this show is lower, so don't don't go in expecting like the same body count, but you feel Vader as a character for like in a way that I don't think has ever been portrayed in live action before. Yeah. Like, yeah, you understand his insecurities at the end, like whenever Obi-Wan beats him. Well, first of all, let's talk about that. When the mask is split and you start hearing Hayden Christensen's voice mixed in with like James Earl Jones's voice. Yeah. And you and McGregor is like just acting his heart out Mm -hmm. and, and doing wonderfully. But when he says, I'm sorry, Anakin, for all of it, and he says, like, no, I'm not your failure. You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. And then he smiles. Mm -hmm. It's good stuff, man. It's good stuff. Yeah. And it makes old Obi-Wan Kenobi seem like less of a dick for for wording it that way to Luke, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Because he says that, you know, Vader killed Anakin, which is... Now it seems like way less of an asshole because he's basically just using Anakin's words. Right, yeah. Whereas before it was like, well, no, I mean, you kind of chopped his legs off. and Yeah, you <laughs> kind of did a lot of that and then didn't tell me they were the same person. So now like the whole thing just seems a little bit more like I understand why he would word it that way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. Were you going to say something? I was going to say, just talk about, uh, was it Riva or Reva? I can't remember. R- Riva, I think. Is- Reba? How they say it in the show? Yeah, uh, I thought she was great at the end of the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. And if they keep going with the show, I'm anxious to see where she'll pop up again. You know, because even if they don't continue with Obi Wan, like she could still pop up somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think more of her. Like, I, I just want to know more about her and where she goes on from here. I, I find that interesting. Like, I would eat up like a novel, like a canon novel, right? Of yeah. Reba. Well, it's it's interesting because. Usually in Star like Star Wars is no stranger to a redemption story. It's one of the ongoing themes. In fact, it might be the most ongoing theme of the whole thing. But but this is the first time in live action I think we've seen someone give up the dark side and then not die right away. Oh, that's interesting. It'll be interesting to see like how they continue with a character that has to redeem themselves for things they've done. Or Or maybe she won't even try to do that. You know, I don't know. Maybe maybe she's like, like well well not killing a child is is about as good as I'm gonna get. You know I don't know. Yeah, but what more do you want from me? <laughs> right, I'm still gonna <laughs> chop off hands. But I think she gave up her lightsaber, so maybe she'll just shoot people's hands. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, do you have anything else? No, I don't think so. Just if, if you're a Star Wars nerd, there's a lot to like here. Uh, d- I just wouldn't get too boggled down with the fact that it doesn't look up to snuff with like. A Star Wars movie. Yeah. I think I think if you can get over that hurdle, there's so much here to enjoy. So Yeah. yeah. I think that's fair because it didn't even I was really not paying attention to anything like that. And um I just I'm a little bit over the moon about the show overall. Yeah. Would you hmm. Would you consider this like if you're ever doing like a, a Star Wars rewatch of all the movies, yeah. would this be between the them? Like as a must, or would you stick to just the movies? Uh, I think, I think I might be tempted to stick to just the movies because this is, you know, it's kind of like six short movies. <laughs> um, yeah, or the runtime is like the length of two short movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, just for like purposes of not making a rewatch stretch out forever, I might not, and might just like stick to just the movies but at the same time when thinking about doing that i'm also tempted to not watch rogue one or solo (laughs) like maybe rogue one you know rogue one just fits so nicely into the a new hope that it's like it's kind of a shame not to yeah but i think i think this is probably the most important thing to watch if you were going to add anything on to like the the nine trilogy movies If you're going to add anything onto this, I would add this on over Rogue One and over Solo. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would say Rogue One is, I still think, the gold standard for, like, Disney's technical filmmaking. Like, I think it's just made super well, like, shot really well. It just looks good. Yeah. But for, like, the overall lore and, like, 
making making the prequels and the original trilogy just fit in a way that they didn't before, I think this show is is perfect yeah. for that. Yeah, if anything else is a must, it's this show to me. Yeah, fair enough. So far. Okay, well, it's been a long one. I think it's time to yeah. to get into the main event. Yeah. Crash. Very different. All right, let's move into our feature review for David Cronenberg's Crash, starting now. In a society driven to extremes, two people met by accident. Were you badly hurt? I think we saw each other at the hospital. You haven't told me where we're going. I haven't. James Ballard has been seduced into a secret world. The car crash is a liberation of sexual energy. Well, the only way to connect is to crash. As the future Ballard, it's something we are all intimately involved in. Why are the police taking this so seriously? They have no idea who we really are. Now, they'll do anything. Describe it to me. To feed their obsession. Is there something here that interests you? This interests me. From the provocative bestseller by J.G. Ballard comes a film directed by David Cronenberg. James Spader, Holly Hunter, Elias Coteus, Deborah Cara Unger, and Rosanna Arquette. Crash. All right. So as always with our Criterion films, they are older films typically have been out for a while, at least a few years. This one has been out a a lot longer than that. Uh, So we will not be doing a spoiler free section like we do with our newer films. We'll jump straight into talking about the movie could potentially spoil the movie from our first words. Uh, I doubt it, but uh, yeah, no spoiler free section. That's right. Okay. So crash was directed by David Cronenberg. It stars James Spader, Holly Hunter, and Elias Kudius? Kateus? That's what I always said. Kateus? Yeah. Elias Kateus. Whatever. Anyway, IMDb Synopsis says, After getting into a serious car accident, a TV director discovers an underground subculture of scarred, omnisexual car crash victims who use car accidents and the raw sexual energy they produce to try and rejuvenate his sex life with his wife long lots of big words <laughs> yeah it was just like it's basically the whole movie but yeah uh mm-hmm. that's what this movie is mm-hmm. it's true it's it's pretty accurate and Although, if, I, if that excited you yeah i don't this know is that, the movie for you i don't know that he's trying to rejuvenate his sex life with his wife Seems like they, they have their own. They have their own thing. They're figuring it out at the beginning of the movie. It seems like they just find a new kink to add into it. I, I think so. I mean, not to dive straight into like too deep before we really say our thoughts on the movie, but uh, I feel that his wife is pretty generally uh, unsatisfied. Like she's hasn't been satisfied in a long time. Um, not to any like. Uh, tangible climax if you will sure and i I think there's a part of it that is him trying to help her get there like to me that that's what the entire i think final line of the movie i I think it's the final line of the movie yeah (laughs) that's what that is entirely about is well hopefully next time yeah well i guess fair enough fair enough (sighs) <sighs> yeah, weird. Okay, so Justin, <laughs> what yeah. is your relationship with David Cronenberg ultimately? And then how do you feel about Crash, uh, sir? David Cronenberg is pretty, I don't want to say hit or miss, but there's just movies 
of his that like I think are probably good that I just don't connect with and want to I wish I connected with more you know um, and then there's a few that just really really do it for me that I think are really great and it to the point where it makes me think I'm missing stuff from the movies of his that I don't really like that much or connect with mm-hmm. you know um, so uh, I I love the fly I think that's great uh, video drum I'm a big fan of uh, although uh, to be fair, Videodrome was when I was first getting into Criterion Collection and I was just buying Criterion films from Barnes & Noble like based on cover, you know, judging the movie by its cover. And Videodrome yep. has like one of the coolest Criterion covers that I've seen in cases. For the DVD version, yeah. Because it's the right yeah. size. Yeah, for the DVD because it yeah, it looks like a VHS tape and it slides out and it it's kind of the bright size of a VHS tape and because it's like a double case. disc, yeah, yeah. Like the Blu-ray version is the same, but it's just smaller in the size of a Blu-ray, so it doesn't have that sort of illusion. <laughs> yeah, that the other one did. So yeah, but um, but it does still have Debbie Harry. Yeah, and. I think that movie just kind of holds a special place in my heart and always will, regardless of how good it is, because it was one of my first Criterion films that I owned and um, one of the first ones that I watched and felt like, look at me watching something, you know, heady and artsy. Look how cultural and... <laughs> I am, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, anyways, I have Videodrome, um, History of Violence I also like. Outside of that, uh, there's nothing of his that I've seen that I'm too hyped on. Uh, and that kind of includes Crash. Yeah. Um, I, I think we, uh, as we talked about a lot in our episode that we did on dead ringers, uh-huh. the second viewing was a lot better than the first, but still it, it was a pretty low bar, like in terms of like the first viewing, um, for both crash and like dead ringers where I was just like, okay, I, I get it, but it's just not really inspiring me, me or like, it's not really moving me or making me think as much as I had hoped. But this time was better. It's just still not a movie that I really feel much like one way or the other about. Like, I think talking about it will be better <laughs> than watching it. Sure. Yeah. So quite same question to you though. Like uh, where are you at on Cronenberg and crash and all that? I think I like Cronenberg more than you, but yeah, he is hit or miss for me. In a lot of the same ways. I'm a big fan of History of Violence, Eastern Promises. I, I like Video Drum quite a bit. Scanners is fun, I guess. I haven't seen Scanners. That's one I need to see. But go yeah. on. Well, but then there's some stuff I don't like. I, I do not like Naked Lunch, though I've only seen it once. I'm sure I would like it more now. I am pretty, I don't know, middle of the road on this movie. I can see what's good about it. But with a lot of like a lot of Cronenberg's movies, I feel like it's more uh, to be experienced rather than to be enjoyed. Yeah, like it's more about the way that it makes you feel. I I just feel like there's value to his movies. I just don't know that that value is like to leave satisfied, <laughs> like the same way you would with like another movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. It's it's tough because I haven't seen Crimes of the Future yet, but it seems like. Based on the trailer, I feel like it's going to have a lot in common with this movie because it, and much like Dead Ringers, right? It's this idea of like sexual intimacy can be can be more than just literal sexual activity between two people. Like it could be anything, and mm-hmm. that energy, that sexual whatever uh, drive, fascination, it it can extend to any sort of subculture and it could be anything to many different people. This idea of real life being so cold and um, difficult to navigate that a lot of characters in David Cronenberg's movies kind of retreat into like this weird sexualization of, of strange things. <laughs> and this movie is just like <laughs> that in spades. So yeah, that's where I'm at. I, I don't know. It's, it's well-made. I like the ideas on display. It's just like, it's at the end of the day, it's not a movie that I enjoy necessarily. And I was happy when it was over. Yeah. It's short. It's yeah. like 90 something minutes, 97 or something like that. So, 
It's not the longest movie, thank goodness. And, like, and parts of it, I think, are like kind of stupid. <laughs> like, I mean, you could say that you could be a cynic and be like, the whole idea of people sexualizing car crashes is stupid, and that's fair. But like, if you could buy into that, I think there's even stuff beyond that that are kind of stupid that like defy logic. Like, there's a big chunk of this movie, like a huge scene that's like really important for all the characters involved, but kind of dumb because that's not how car crashes work. Like, there's a scene where a bunch of firefighters are like pulling dead bodies out of like this recently, like these recently crashed car victims. There's no police anywhere <laughs> blocking people from the yeah. scene. It's just like, you know what I mean? People are like yeah. throwing dead sheets on bodies while they're still like in the cars and stuff like that. Like, it. It feels like kind of sloppy in places like that. I think where it's like yeah, we're talking about when they they get out and like yeah, they take pictures of James Spader's wife and stuff. Like yeah. she's like modeling yeah. with in the car crashes and stuff. Right, like whenever they find like one of their friends from like their little car crash cult did a car crash like on his own without without them there and like reenacted like a famous car crash for Jane's Jane uh, Jane Mansfield, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's just disturbing and strange, like subject matter wise, because like they're taking other people's lives into like their own hands for their weird, you know, sexual gratification and <laughs> killing dogs that they threw in the back seat just for historical accuracy. But like, yeah, like the idea that they could get out and like walk around this scene of a, this horrible accident with like multiple pe- people dead and no one be like, hey, who are you? Get out of here. Yeah. Is a little far fetched, in my opinion. <laughs> It is. It's it's hard for me to examine things like that too much <laughs> in this movie because just like, uh, as you said, like the whole premise is not realistic, right? <laughs> no, nobody, nobody has this fetish in real life, right? I hope not. I mean, I, I assume. Like this isn't some like deep dive into like, you know, a world that you don't know, you know, that is out there. <laughs> it's all fantasy. Um, Once they really dive into this group of people, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's, I don't know. I, I, I don't even know if like how literal I'm supposed to take that. Yeah, that occurred to me too, where I was like, I mean, is this even like, does this even take place in the real world or is this in this like <laughs> this weird fever dream? Because like, I don't think there's any police officers in this whole movie of any of these car accidents. Like they'll get in like no. car crashes on the side of the road and it's like, no one will come <laughs> or acknowledge it. Yeah. And I, I think we get sirens after they do like the James Dean uh, crash recreation. Oh yeah. I like, guess oh, the cops come there and break it up, but yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. They do. Um, but like, they they don't come to help at a car crash ever. So like, I understand your point, right? And like, they come to like ruin their good time. <laughs> yeah, at best, at their like most, they're breaking up know? a bunch of kids making out in the woods or something. <laughs> yeah, and I think that to me was maybe the most interesting part of the movie. This this watch around was the like I, I guess maybe I, I understood more with this idea of recreating historical car crashes. Like, yeah. I think, I don't know. I find that interesting as like mm-hmm. a group of people who are into that. Um, and maybe because it seems slightly more realistic, it's easier to connect with or right. connect well, with, like, but like understand. Right. Well, like also they have, they kind of cover it there because like they have stunt drivers doing this, right? Like, so like the drivers are professional, even though they're getting hurt, they're getting hurt in the places they anticipate. Whereas yeah. like when you have these randos who aren't trained drivers start to try to do the same stuff, it's like. They're just going to kill themselves real like immediately. This wouldn't work. This this fetish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's part of the problem, I guess. And, and I guess the question, uh, and and I think like I know the answer, but I don't. Is this movie intended to be like genuinely erotic in any way for you? Interesting. I think the lighting and some of the way it's shot 
is like undeniably um, supposed to be kind of like sexy and sleek and cool, like that that '90s erotic thriller type way. Mm-hmm. But like with every Cronenberg movie, even even like what's that one with uh, about Freud? With Michael Fassbender and the Dangerous Kier- Method, Dangerous Method, right? Like that one's like one of the more uh, sexually explicit movies that he's done. Mm-hmm. E- even that one, I don't feel sex. The sex is sexy. Like History of Violence, there's like a consensual sex scene between like a husband and wife. It's just uncomfortable. Yeah, I, oh, I think God, yes. <laughs> I think Cronenberg likes to approach sex in a very distant way, like a non-judgmental way. But in that non-judgmental, matter-of-fact way that he presents it, it's not sexy. It's not filmed like a, you know, like a sex scene is normally filmed to, like, elicit, like, titillation and stuff, you know? I don't know. I mean, do you agree with that? I, I Actually, I think that it is filmed that way, but intentionally to be at odds with what's underneath it and what's, you know, what's informing it with what's going on, right? Like, yeah. Because I I think maybe the opening scene of the movie where we start at the the airplane hangar mm-hmm. with the wife uh, with um, some other man like yeah some guy that's that's pretty like sexual and without the context of the rest of the movie. <laughs> um, See, I didn't I didn't feel like that was very sexy at all because like the she's like pinned like it's mostly from her point of view or like her face where it's like she's laid up against this flat metal of the plane like this cold you know, in different yeah. machine. We don't have like, we have like close-ups of her body though. Right. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, and like the lingerie um, or I don't know if it's lingerie, but whatever, like the, but like the legs snap. Yeah. I don't know what the, stockings, <laughs> the word is. Right? Stockings. Yeah. That are like the little snaps, um, stuff like that. And, and then I think there's another scene with, um, her and James Spader in bed. It's when she's talking to him and kind of giving him the fantasy and asking him the questions of like whether or not he would do anything with uh, Elias Cotes's character mm-hmm. and whether or not he found him attractive. Like that to me is shot in a way that's like, like you said, like very nineties erotic thriller. And it's like, like I think if I didn't have sound, some of it would seem like stuff like that would seem um, maybe a little bit more genuinely like intended to be erotic. Right. But I know, I think that's what was maybe most effective for me or what felt more effective this time around was feeling the kind of the, the clash, like the dissonance between <laughs> some of the way that some of it was shot and the actual like subject matter or whenever it would be a sex scene um, in a car or with a gross scar or something. <laughs> yeah. That scar scene. Yeah. Oof. And I guess the, the, the big scar on what's her name? Rosanna Arquette. Rosanna Arquette. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the big scar on her, just like uh, add it to the, the list of uh, Cronenberg vaginas that aren't vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> but that yeah, was, but like, gross. But, yeah, I mean, but I, I see what you're saying though. But like, even his, like, I think a lot of his movies, through a, a lot of the characters are, are searching for intimacy, either through sex or things that replace sex, whether they be like you know mutilation of some kind or, or you know car crashes, whatever. It, he. I feel like Cronenberg approaches it very coldly. Mm -hmm. Even when like the lighting and like the shooting style might seem sexy, the scenes themselves don't. Yeah. There's that scene where she's like giving him like the fantasy and the idea of like, could he be attracted to this, this guy that's like in this weird car cult fetish thing. But like, Mm -hmm. and yeah, it may like look sexy, but like the context of which it's going on and like the, the darkness and the, the weird road that they're headed down, it, it feels dirty. It, and I'm going to bring up history of violence again, like the sex scene between like the husband and the wife. There's a couple of them. 
both of them are uncomfortable and it's it's more like clinically like looking at these two characters and the intimacy between them in a non-judgmental way than it is trying to titillate that that's kind of how i feel about cronenberg in general right like all even dead ringers you know like the characters there it's like they have to find some way to to communicate in like a way that's not quite sexual but it means the same thing to them yeah so and i think that's just kind of an ongoing thing with him i i i don't think he's bad at filming sex i think he's just very matter of fact about it and the characters are usually in such dark places <laughs> that it feels strange yeah yeah I, I mean i think my answer to the question of whether or not this movie is supposed to be genuinely erotic is no <laughs> yeah. um personally yeah um, no i don't think so at all D there's a clip of roger ebert arguing with uh siskel about this movie that i i watched have you seen that no no it's actually pretty interesting. They they actually talk about that same thing where um, Siskel did not like it at all. Uh, he thought it was like, I don't know, I don't I don't remember what he thought, but he didn't like it. And um, Ebert basically said that this is like a, <laughs> this is like a softcore porn movie, but the porn like all the sexy porn stuff, is replaced with like really unpleasant, gross stuff, but it still operates plot wise much the same way like a softcore porn on Cinemax would. <laughs> yeah. And he's not wrong. Uh, and Ebert actually defended no. the movie. He's, I don't know how much he liked it, but he liked it more than Siskel. And he, he said that um, he didn't think it was supposed to be sexy at all. Yeah. And that's I think, much um, the point. I think he, he gave it three and a half out of four stars. That is uh, a pretty good review from Roger which is Ebert. pretty high. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it makes a point, you know, I, I think if you were to talk out the plot of this movie, it would be um, not unlike the scene in Boogie Nights where they're going yep. over the plot. Yep. <laughs> we're like, you know, we're, so and so Macy's enters like, yeah. and they go at it and then the other person watches and masturbates and then they go to the other room and then these two characters go at it. And that's kind of like yeah. stuff happens in this movie and then. Yeah. But then like in that same sex. scene. The director, Burt Reynolds' character, is like, no, instead I want to have these two characters do it. And he's like, okay. And, like, no script revisions necessary. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really matter right. who or why. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think maybe the thing that took me the longest to, like, adjust to in terms of, like, you know, letting this whole thing go that this isn't really a a real thing and not to get bogged down, but like Holly Hunter, mm -hmm. like, am I wrong in thinking that her husband dies in that initial car crash with James Spader? That's what I understood. Okay. Cause that's where I was like, I don't know. I, I, I guess I was a little confused because she was in this cult beforehand somehow is that your understanding? And so like, was her husband dying part of that and like not necessarily intended or because she never seemed to be really that concerned. Or yeah. I, I feel like the Holly Hunter character gets kind of done dirty in this movie. Cause like she's really heavily in the first act in the beginning of the second act. And then she kind of disappears for a while and only mm -hmm. kind of pops back up in her relation to other characters, you know, and like the whole, like, uh, back and forth between her and James Spader is kind of all but forgotten about by the end of it. Yeah. I, and I don't know if she's like, then she's the one that kind of gets James Spader into it. And then, and then he quickly moves past her into uh, other things, you know, like, yeah, I don't like, know. I get the, I get the vibe that, you know, his sex scene with, uh, Elias Coteus is, is, um, you know, maybe like a, a big leap for his character. Like, I don't necessarily get the vibe that um, like homosexuality is something that he had dabbled in before. So that's like a leap. And then the next leap up is um, Rosanna Arquette's character, who's like yeah. basically in like a giant metal cast and has huge scars. Right. And by that point, <laughs> uh, Holly Hunter is a bit tame. Yeah. It's a little vanilla. Yeah. Vanilla. That's a good word. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if that's, yeah, I agree that like her character, we don't really get, um, 
maybe what I want from it by the end of the movie and it gets left off. Necessarily. Yeah. Um, Yeah. No, I agree. I had the same kind of thought. I was like, so, I mean, is she just kind of relieved that her husband is dead so she can go full time car crash cult or was he in on it too? And she's just like, whatever, you know, it's the, it's the luck of the draw whenever you get off on car crashes, like eventually your number's up. I don't know. And she's just sort of like (laughs) ready to roll with it. You know, who knows? But the movie is certainly not interested in exploring that. No, <laughs> no, uh, it's not. And I mean, maybe that that's maybe intentional because it's not really what it's about. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, these people seem pretty checked out loss. of the real world and all for all intents and purposes. Yeah. Uh, and to go back to what we talked about in the very, very beginning with the wife you know that the very first time we see her and James Spader together is after she's had that opening encounter with the the pilot or whoever uh and we get the idea that they're in like an open relationship and seeking like uh, other people and other other Thrills. things and yeah yeah it seems in an attempt to to be able to be satisfied to like achieve orgasm um mm-hmm. because i think that's the first question he asks her Right. James Spader to his wife. Yeah. But when she talks about uh, having sex with this guy, it's like, you know, right. did you have an orgasm? And she, she says, no. Um, and I connect that with the end crash because he's asking her if she got injured and she didn't somehow. Right. <laughs> um, but, and I kind of equate that like it, injury with like the, the orgasm and like the lack of getting injured somehow in that crazy crash with like her inability um, to achieve that. Cause we never see her achieve it with uh, James Spader at any point either. Right. Right. Or I assume with Elias Codius either. Yeah. Interesting. I so. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. I kind of came to that conclusion this time, but the first time I watched this movie, granted I was much younger and probably paying attention much less closely cause I wasn't going to have to talk about it. Yeah. But I took that as like, <laughs> At this point, they're just like seeking higher and higher thrills until one of them dies. Yeah. You know, like they'll, they'll never stop until they're dead. So it's just like the search for sexual gratification, the bar is just going to keep getting higher and higher and higher. And uh, I think they're fully aware that they have a limited, a limited time yeah. and, and, and capability of doing this hobby. Yeah. I think the first time I kind of took it as like the, the ultimate the ultimate um <laughs> i guess like orgasm or like the sexiest thing that can happen when you're into getting car crashes into car crashes um would be to die in a car wreck <laughs> yeah and so i took his like maybe next time is like maybe you'll die next time well, what does he say what does uh Ilias's character say about james dean like his last oh, words yeah. were like something and then he proceeded to become immortal immortalized or something like that for dying in such a way yeah yeah, the idolizes death and death in the car crash. Hmm. I also really like the way that when they're on the balcony of their apartment, James Spader and his wife. Yeah. Like the way that all the shots out on the balcony are framed, like there's always traffic and roads and just like just nothing but like in like city <laughs> like mm-hmm. all around them, like in every like peripheral shot. It's like it's this like ever present the idea that well, A, there's like, you know, you're seeing cars and literal traffic and, and stuff like that. But then also it's like this sort of, they seem so distant from everything else going on in the world. Like the world is still spinning like normal and normal people are living their lives. But these two are just like in their own little world away from all that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I thought I was going to like this movie a lot more this time. Like early on when James Spader and Holly Hunter are talking about the traffic they're like, do you ever notice there's more traffic after they've been in their right. horrid car wreck? Seem like there's just more and more these days, and like, and coupled with those shots that you're talking about on the balcony, um, I thought I was off. I was like, ooh, that this movie might actually be going more interesting places than I gave it credit for. Um, I th- I think it it, it takes one it, simplistic it idea me. and then just makes a 90 minute movie out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think by the end it I was less interested, and it's still, um. It still kind of lost me. And uh, I think, too, I, I had totally forgotten that he was a TV director and was, I guess, direct was he directing like a car crash sort of like PSA commercial or something? Something. But 
He has like the only directing job in the world where you can just walk away at any time and do anything you want. Yeah. <laughs> the the movie's certainly not interested in exploring what any of these people do for a living. No. <laughs> Cause like the only reason we see what James Spader does for a living is I guess just the uh parallel or coincidence or something. <laughs> right. And maybe maybe that's there to like Maybe there's something deeper about, you know, directing car crashes and and being a director and like the the things that you film and the way that you film them. And then Cronenberg filming the stuff that he does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I don't know what that is yet. Yeah, I wonder if that was the character's occupation in the novel, because this is like an adaptation of a novel. That's true. I bet it is because I don't know it maybe it's too on the nose and that's why I just didn't really bother to think about that too much. Sure. Well, I mean, even if it's a Cronenberg invention, it's probably because like, maybe he was just like, well, I know how directing works, so I can just have the character do that. Now <laughs> that I understand. I don't have to research <laughs> what people do on their jobs. Mm hmm. Uh, cool. Yeah. Well, any, anything else you want to get into? I don't think so. I think I would just say that like, at least for the, the first time that I watched it, this movie had a reputation about it mm -hmm. you know of just being like the weird um nc-17 ca car crash movie yeah where people get off to car crashes and, and, I, and i think that conjures up a certain movie in your head um <laughs> and i i think for better or worse this movie is quite like different than what i expected you know mm -hmm. um it's i think it's not quite the like the just like the just super weird, shocking movie that I thought I would get. It's it's a lot more subdued in certain places. Yeah, but I, I can see this stuff in the 90s being pretty crazy. Like, Yeah. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's not fair for me to say that through a, I think, 20, 2011 <laughs> window when I watched this movie for the first time. Because I, th I think the movie does suffer a bit from... It's being of its time. <laughs> you think so? You I think, think it would like be crazier this... now if you made it now? I think so, but I, I think there's just some certain aspects like I, like the look of the movie and the score and even like the opening credits just like start me off on the wrong foot because they're so bad. And like oh, yeah, the, the, the font. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the font and it's it's almost like it's almost like look what we can do with computer graphics now and it feels just ultra dated in a way that isn't charming. <laughs> not fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I mean nostalgic. you're not wrong. It's like it the whole movie's kind of got this weird, ugly nineties sheen to it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it it feels like a nineties movie in in uh, a bad way to me. Yeah, it it feels like I I think Ebert had it right on the nose. Like it feels like a softcore porn movie, just higher budget and with car crashes instead of like lots of boobs. Better actors, yeah, and actresses. Okay, that's all. That's all I had to say. I think it was just like the reputation of this movie. Um, I expected more, but yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, at the end of the day, I say this is pretty middle-of-the-road Cronenberg, in my opinion. Definitely not my least favorite, but no. definitely... What is your least favorite, did you say, already? Mm, least favorite. Uh, Naked Lunch. Yeah. <laughs> That's mine, too. Um, I would say, number one, uh, A History of Violence, I think, is probably my favorite mm -hmm. Cronenberg movie. Yeah. What about you? Uh, I think my f my favorite is probably The Fly. Oh, uh, yeah. The Fly is really good. Yeah. I thought it was really cool and really interesting. And um, maybe it's like the most <laughs> accessible and straightforward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would I would say so. I, I would say that's probably as close as you're going to see David Cronenberg attempt to make a crowd-pleasing movie. Yeah. 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 And... I agree with Naked Lunch is maybe my least favorite, but the the other close candidate to me is I, I really was not into a dangerous method. Yeah. 
I remember you saying that. I remember liking that one, but I don't know why. I haven't seen it since theaters. Yeah, that's the last time I saw it, so. Yeah. yeah. Anyways. Right. Moving uh, on? Yeah, mo- moving on. Yeah, so normally at this point of the show in these Casually Criterion episodes, we make our choices for the Criterion poll that we're going to put up on Twitter, and we have a theme, and we each pick a movie based on the theme and tell you mm-hmm. to go vote. But we're not doing that this time. We're we're just picking a movie and we're going with it. So, uh, Mike, do you want to tell the people what movie? Uh, I do, but I don't remember the order of the words in it. So, okay, well, I can do it because I have it right here. Oh, I got it right here. Okay, four months, three weeks, and two days. Yeah. And yeah. Sorry, I had to I had to Google it because I was like, oh, what is it? is it like four months? Two? No oh, crap. What is it? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it's Justin. Why don't you tell everyone why we chose four months, three weeks, and two days as our next movie? Yeah, well, I, I'm pretty sure anybody listening probably could figure that out. Um, well, uh, just was, we do have listeners that aren't in the United States. That's true, but I think it's pretty international news, too. Like, I, I've, there are some podcasts I listen to about uh, soccer, like European teams specifically, and even those people talked about it. <laughs> um, yeah. But, Fair enough. But yeah, the, the, the big thing is um, the time we're recording this uh, last Friday, the Roe v. Wade decision got announced and, and um, basically women lost a uh, basic human right <laughs> and abortion is um, now in danger of being completely yeah. eradicated <laughs> yeah. and outlawed and, and Ill- uh, made illegal, um, which uh, I'm not going to like mince words is really terrible terrible horrible thing and a giant step backwards in terms of progress as a civilization and a a society and a country yep and that's likely just the beginning yeah yeah and who knows yeah it it can it can get a lot potentially get even worse yeah um but i I think this is just what's on my mind and um i think tackling this movie is important and, and i think uh, a movie that's as um because i've seen this once before and it's been a while but to my recollection a movie that's as this like straightforward um about abortion and um demonizing making abortion illegal and denying women the right to medical treatment and the the freedom of choice and how dangerous that is um i think that's something that's important not that like we're going to make people watch it <laughs> necessarily but if anybody hasn't seen it, um, I haven't. Seen maybe it. they'll watch it. You haven't seen it? No. Okay. Well, not that you need convincing <laughs> to join this side or anything, <laughs> but like, um, you know, I I worked a event for a uh, for work, um, covering it with video, but it was a fundraising thing for um, a pro choice uh, group here in in Houston, uh, in Texas, and there was something that they said that like kind of like stuck with me is that like the thing that, that needs to happen is exposure to abortion, to what it truly is and not hyperbole and not lies. And, um, and just having it around as a more of a normal part of the conversation instead of like just this weird, crazy thing that we don't talk about cause it's a touchy subject. Like yeah. the more, in the conversation is the more normal it is. And, and so I think like just at this time, it feels like the right thing to do to cover this movie. Yeah. I mean, it's like the least we could do to contribute to this horrible thing. Like, like the least yeah. we could do and pretty much all we can do at this point. Yeah. And if it doesn't contribute, I don't know, just putting it out there, like more conversation around it is good at the end of the day. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's fair. I, I think, um, as someone who comes from a conservative family, like whenever they start talking about things like that, it it becomes pretty obvious pretty quickly that like they only know what like, you know, right wing pundits say about it. And they don't really comprehend all the various reasons that like an abortion, it could be required or necessary. Right. So, Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of it does seem, yeah, like ignorance from from the point of view of someone who knows a few people who are who pro life, as they like to call themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
so that's it. That's uh, that's the movie. I'm sure we'll get into that <laughs> sort of talk in the discussion um, much more when we actually do the episode on it. Sure. But that's our next one. Four so- months, three sounds weeks, like a blast. two days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but with that, uh, I think this is episode done, right? Yes, sir. Episode done. Um, I'm not sure if that will be our next episode or if our next episode will be uh, Crimes of the Future. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> do we want to do another Cronenberg or um, do a movie tackling abortion? Another criterion. Another, yeah. I don't know. But yeah, our next two episodes will be uh, four months, three weeks, and two days, and uh, David Cronenberg's Crimes of the Future to go nicely with the episode we just recorded. That's right. Um, so uh, until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks, Jack Wag- Jake Wagner Russell, for doing our intro and outro <laughs> music. You can find more of his music at soundcloud.com slash bobscotch. And until then, see you later. See you later. I'm going to go get in a car crash now. Don't. That sounds scary. Yeah, but it sounds so thrilling. All right. <laughs> Fine. If you insist. All right. Bye. Thank you.